Lisa Gay Woodford from the Children's National um, uh, Research Institute in Washington, DC. I'd like to thank PKD, PK Doc and the organizers for the invitation to present in this exciting symposium. In the next 30 minutes, I'd like to pick up on the terrific presentations that you've just heard from uh, Dr. Aaron Hartung and Dr. Max Lebo and outline the state of play for translating some of these insights um, into therapeutics for ARPKD. Uh, as a relevant disclosure, I am a consultant for Atsuka Pharmaceuticals. So let me just jump right in um, by noting that ARPKD has an incidence of 1 in 26,500 live births, so it's much less common than its dominant counterpart. Mutations in PKHD1 are responsible for virtually all typical cases of ARPKD. Mutations in DZIP1L have been described in four, P four pedigrees with an ARPKD-like uh, phenotype. And recently, in collaboration with Freetown Hildebrandt's group, we've identified mutations in the human orthologue of the gene disrupted in the CPK mouse. Now, PKHD1 is an enormous gene. It extends over 470 kilobases in the genome. Um, it contains 86 predicted exons with 67 exons comprising the, uh, the longest open reading frame, which encodes FPC, um, that is this uh, enormous 4,077 4, amino acid protein with a large um, uh, extracellular and terminus, a single pass uh, transmembrane region, and a, um, a short carboxy uh, uh, domain. ARPKD is the prototype of a group of diseases that Fred Shushi um, described as the hepatorenal fibrocystic diseases, a subset of largely rare recessively transmitted cilia-related disorders or ciliopathies. These are characterized by renal cystic disease and hepatic disease that includes congenital hepatic fibrosis and Caroli syndrome, as well as in some of these disorders, systemic manifestations. However, it must be noted that among children with polycystic kidney disease who present um, to pediatric nephrology departments, um, the total number of patients with early onset ADPKD, primarily due to mutations in PKD1, or with HNF1 beta related disease um, may be comparable to the total number of patients that present with actual ARPKD. Now, Aaron reviewed the clinical expression of uh, ARPKD, and I just want to summarize a couple of points with this slide. As I mentioned, the incidence, and this is this uh, uh, calculated incidence, comes from um, analysis of electronic health records, is about 1 in 26,500 live births. Typically, these children are born at 34 to 36 weeks gestation. Their perinatal problems primarily are due um, to their poor lung development, resulting in respiratory insufficiency. And again, our EHR-based analysis indicates that there's about a 21% uh, perinatal mortality due to respiratory insufficiency. The major issue for those that survive the newborn period um, is their kidney disease, is there's massive necromegaly, hyponatremia, hypertension, and declining um, function. But this is not an inexorable course of declining function. In fact, these children can have markedly decreased kidney function um, that can then stabilize and even transiently improve during uh, childhood. So the EGFR is not a, a linear um, uh, course in children with ARPKD. These children also have uh, invariant liver involvement um, with some of these, uh, with a subset of these children progressing to have portal hypertension um, with consequent variceal bleeding, and because of their bile duct abnormalities, an increased risk of cholangitis. ARPKD can be associated with poor growth. This may be largely due to feeding issues, an issue that's not been completely resolved yet. There are reports of aneurysms both intracranially and extracranially. Um, and there has been concern um, uh, by some clinicians about neurocognitive issues, although a small study of about 22 patients with um, ARPKD um, from the CKID study indicates that there were not um, uh, significant differences from between ARPKD children and, um, and children with other causes of CKD in terms of their neurocognition. Now, in terms of clinical trials, um, uh, ARPKD, despite the fact that we have been learning um, a great deal about its clinical manifestations, um, even some of its pathobiology, which is largely shared um, with the dominant form of the disease, there are only five registered clinical trials in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and three of these have been conducted in North America, 
The first is a longitudinal cohort study, which I will describe in, in a few minutes. The second is a phase one study of a tesavitinab, which is an oral bioavailable small molecule receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. That study is now closed to recruitment. And then there was the longitudinal NIH um, study of ARPKD and related hepatorenal fibrocystic diseases that is now also closed to recruitment. The remaining two studies are from a pharmaceutical, are sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, and they've yet to begin recruitment. So five studies overall. Compare this to ADPKD. Worldwide, there are 127 studies that are reported in clinicaltrials.gov. 85% are being conducted in North America and in Europe. So why this difference? Particularly why this difference when related disease manifestations in ADPKD and ARPKD um, share lots of commonality, suggesting that ADPKD therapies might be effective in ARPKD. Well, the issues start with the disease onset. This is a cystic lesion that develops um, uh, largely in utero, causing um, massive nephromegaly by birth. Kidney volume. Um, uh, studies to date have suggested that kidney volume can increase sometimes um, uh, exponentially until two to four years of age, but then growth slows, probably due to secondary scarring and loss of nephrons. So the, the, the trajectory of kidney volume uh, is, is not able to be fit to a single um, equation. Kidney function is variable and not well co correlated with disease severity. So there are children who have massively enlarged kidneys with relatively normal kidney function and children who have moderately sized kidneys who have a significant decrease in kidney function. And unfortunately, there are no predictive markers of disease progression. So what is needed to conduct or to, to actually to design and then conduct clinical trials in ARPKD? Well, this slide sort of captures what's needed. Research ready patient cohorts, pathobiologic insights, biomarkers of disease progression, and therapeutics, both involving drug repurposing and novel agents. So let me start with research ready cohorts and international databases. So in terms of databases, uh, Max Lebo has described to you the ARPKD uh, registry or AREG-PKD um, that is based in Cologne. Um, this is a um, network that consists of 26 um, participating um, centers, largely from the German uh, Pediatric Nephrology Group and the ESCAPE trial networks. Um, uh, as of April 2021, um, there are uh, 684 patients that have been registered and 567 um, active patients in this retrospective and prospective um, uh, registry. The second registry um, is the hepatorenal fibrocystic disease registry that is part of the U.S. Childhood Cystic Kidney Disease Core Center that is funded by the NIH um, and uh, centered at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and the Children's National. We have 20 participating sites in the U.S. and have registered 154 ARPKD patients, again, retrospective and prospective study. And then finally, there's the UK Rare Disease Registry, or RADAR, that has an ARPKD nephronophthysis uh, dedicated arm. And this is a nationwide um, uh, registry um, in the UK that is uh, actively uh, accruing patients. Now, I would point out that um, our database in the US um, has also reached out to international colleagues in Canada, Latin America, and Brazil, Singapore, and India. And the second thing that I would point out is that all three of these databases have made an effort to harmonize um, their uh, data dictionaries so that there are common data elements that are being used um, with the extension to other colleagues across the world. We are on the threshold of having truly an international network of uh, registries that capture with the same data elements or harmonized set of data elements uh, information from ARPKD patients. If we switch now to think about pathobiologic insights, there are um, there's pathobiology that's common among uh, the PKD, AD, and AR, and then there are specific AR PKD related um, uh, aspects. I've borrowed this cartoon from a lovely review that Jared Grantham published a number of years ago um, to make um, a couple of points. First of all, cystic epithelia um, is disordered um, with um, the PK, uh, the, the sorry, the PKD proteins being expressed um, in several um, subcompartments of these epithelia and controlling um, uh, various signaling pathways. Um, this leads to um, abnormalities in proliferation, apoptosis, cell adhesion, and differentiation. So clearly, the polycystic kidney diseases are an epithelial dysfunction um, disorder. 
But in addition to epithelial dysfunction, there's also interstitial inflammation, and that arises because of interstitial monocyte um, uh, invasion and uh, fibroblast invasion um, to the interstitial space um, between the cystic tubules and normal um, tubules. There are also abnormalities of, um, of the basement membrane. And then just by virtue of uh, physical um, uh, compression, cyst expansion um, uh, uh, impairs adjacent tubules, and although not shown on this slide, compromises the vasculature and the, and the associated lymphatic center system. So AR PKD pathogenesis or PKD pathogenesis as a whole really is the, uh, the sum total of epithelial dysfunction, interstitial inflammation, and fibrosis. And we need to keep this in mind as we think about um, uh, targeted therapies. I then want to just switch gears and talk about um, uh, some genetic insights. So um, collaborative work by Greg Jamino's lab and our own previously dem demonstrated a synergistic interaction between PKHD1 and PKD1 in mice, such that PKHD1 mice um, carrying one defective PKD1 um, allele developed rapidly progressive renal cystic disease. And a recent study by Peter Harris's group extended this observation by generating diagenic mice, that is mice that have a hypomorph allele of PKD1 and a hypomorph allele, sorry, PKHD1 and a hypomorph allele of PKD1. And what you'll note in, um, in, in this uh, uh, portion of the slide is that these diagenic mice have much more um, significant renal um, cystic disease. But what's really particularly interesting from this study is that um, when looking at um, uh, where the cystic lesion begins, in the diagenic mice, um, the cystic lesion begins in the proximal tubule, and that's evident at day zero. Um, but by the time these mice get to be 12 days of age, there has been a phenotypic switch such that um, these diagenic mice uh, have predominantly collecting duct um, uh, cystic lesions. And this is um, validated from in work from um, the rat. And so the PCK rat um, uh, has a splicing defect um, in the rat ortholog of PKHD1. Uh, and when, a he when there is heterozygous loss of PKD1 um, in these rats, you can see that their renal cystic disease is much more severe than for the PCK rat alone. So the bottom line is, at least in rodent models, PKD1 alone doesn't fully recapitulate the ARPKD phenotype, but does cause, um, and data I haven't been able to show you, a transcriptome response. Um, and the full phenotype is evoked by a reduction in polysystem 1, suggesting that these proteins operate in common pathways. They may not physically interact necessarily, but they operate in common pathways. So let me summarize what we know specifically about this protein and its biologic functions. So um, uh, in collaboration with Greg Germino's uh, group, we have demonstrated that full length polysystem undergoes notch-like processing, which releases the large extracellular end terminus um, uh, and also releases intracellularly the carboxy um, uh, terminal domain. Now in work from, um, uh, from uh, Chris Ward's group, um, the the uh, FPC protein, whether it's the full protein or the proteolytic cleavage, um, is incorporated into exome-like vesicles or ELVs, and this um, these structures contain other polysystem proteins. In fact, Ward calls this the polysystem complex, and he um, and others have speculated that the polysystem complex is involved in extracellular signaling. In terms of intracellular functions, um, these largely would uh, result from um, the uh, regulated proteolytic cleavage of the carboxy terminus. Um, and again, in collaboration with Greg Germino's group, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, found that there's indirect regulation of the E3 family of ubiquitin lipases, um, and that affects the um, uh, epithelial membrane, uh, the apical membrane expression of the epithelial sodium channel. Um, leading to dysregulated sodium reabsorption, um, dysregulated uh, uh, TGF beta um, receptor signaling, and um, dysregulated rho activity, disrupting cytoskeletal organization. And all of these abnormalities can result in um, features that we see in ARPKD clinically hypertension, histopathologically fibrosis, and of course, cystogenesis.
In addition, um, uh, following data uh, that, that comes largely from ADPKD studies, recent work has demonstrated that ARPKD also involves uh, metabolic uh, reprogramming, which in fact may contribute to all of the major phenotypic features shown on the far right hand side of the slide. And finally, the regulated cleavage of this carboxy uh, terminus undergoes regulated um, uh, translocation into the nucleus where um, the carboxy terminus um, has been proposed by a number of groups, including our own, to regulate um, uh, uh, gene expression. Um, and as a translational regulator, one of the key uh, uh, genes of interest is the CMIC proto-oncogene. So that's the epithelial story for ARPKD, but I think it's again important to point out that PKD um, in terms of its pathogenesis involves chronic inflammation. So as I've mentioned, cyst expansion causes anatomic distortion of kidney parenchyma, reduction in renal blood flow, and pericystic changes, including inflammation. There's dedifferentiation of cystic tubular epithelial cells, and this interestingly is associated with increased production or enhanced production of pro-inflammatory, pro-fibrotic, and chemotractic cytokines. These pro-inflammatory factors um, uh, uh, are present within the cystic epithelia, surrounding the cysts and the vasculature, and in response, macrophages um, accumulate uh, and potentially drive cyst formation. So this is not only true of ADPKD kidneys shown at the top of the slide in panel A, but it is also true for ARPKD kidneys, um, suggesting that uh, chronic inflammation is a feature of this disease that, should, that needs to be addressed as we consider translational strategies. In terms of thinking about biomarkers of disease progression, um, of course, there's been an enormous amount of work um, uh, done in ADPKD, um, but there is now new work in ARPKD that is ARPKD specific. So let me start um, uh, this portion of the discussion in just briefly summarizing the clinical um, uh, potential the potential clinical biomarkers of disease progression to briefly touch on where we are with biochemical markers to talk about genetic biomarkers that um, may portend um, different disease courses. And then to finish this portion of the talk, um, uh, focusing on uh, new uh, imaging modalities that may help us uh, chart the course of this disease. So let's start with um, this uh, figure, which um, is taken from the lovely work um, by uh, the AREG uh, uh, network. Um, and, and again, as Max has pointed out to you, children who are um, born with uh, ARPKD who have a combination of oligo and hydramnios in large cysts, uh, and large kidneys and renal cysts on uh, sonographic findings have a probability of about 32% of requiring renal replacement therapy in the first 12 months of life and up to 35% by the first 36 months of life. This compares or should be contrasted with children who um, don't have any abnormalities in terms of the amniotic fluid level and don't have any major sonographic abnormalities in terms of their kidney size or, the, or, the, or evidence for cysts. And so this study, I think, sets the stage as the first study to, um, to develop uh, clinical predictors for um, different subgroups of ARPKD in terms of um, their clinical disease course. This is not as um, uh, robust a case when we think about biochemical markers, because although copeptin has um, been identified as a very promising biomarker, not only to predict disease progression, but also response to tolvaptin treatment in adults, this has not yet been evaluated either in children with ADPKD um, uh, or with children with ARPKD. So those kinds of rigorous assessments still need to be done. When we think about other um, biomarkers that have been published in pediatric PKD, even if it's pediatric ADPKD, um, the data are much less compelling. There is um, some evidence for a from a small pediatric PKD study that elevated uh, serum and urine levels of angiotensinogen um, may um, indicate activation, uh, intrarenal activation of the RAAS uh, system. Um, and um, this uh, may be a marker even before the onset of hypertension, but there isn't a correlation in terms of um, structural disease progression or functional decline. In terms of urinary um, inflammatory markers, which have been evaluated again in ADPKD, IL-18, NGAL, MCP, and beta-2 microglobulin um, really have not shown very much promise at all uh, for pediatric PKD. Um, uh, and, and I should note that they actually haven't been studied rigorously in ARPKD yet, but the, the data are not um, terribly compelling for pediatric ADPKD. 
And then, of course, there's this whole burgeoning field of microRNAs, um, uh, which Lee et al., writing in a recent review, have suggested that um, these may also be potentially exploited as biomarkers of disease. But that work um, is a ways off, particularly for children. When we think about genetics, um, and the genotype phenotype correlation. Um, this, these two um, panels are taken from a, um, a recent report from the NHGRI study. And, and what they were able to show is that um, in children who had truncating mutations, that they had a much more uh, aggressive disease course than children who had non truncating mutations. Interestingly, um, as you look at the, the right hand side of that panel, that relationship switches in adults, although I would point out that the, that the numbers are low, but it's still nonetheless uh, a provocative finding. If we think about the um, prenatal presentation versus the non prenatal presentation of, um, of ARPKD uh, patients, clearly those who present in the perinatal period, and this is all patients in terms of their genetics, um, have a much more um, aggressive disease course. So now if we switch to, um, to thinking about genetics um, and can we find genetic um, uh, signals that could be exploited as uh, uh, biomarkers of disease. Um, I, I would draw your attention to this very nice study from the NHGRI uh, group that uh, demonstrated in their cohort of about 78 patients with uh, ARPKD, those presenting with uh, truncating mutations um, in childhood had a much more severe uh, disease course or accelerated disease course compared to their uh, counterparts who had non-truncating uh, mutations. Um, and, and in the whole cohort, those who presented in the perinatal period, regardless of mutation, um, had a much more accelerated uh, decline in, um, in their renal function than those presenting later in life. In recent studies um, that I believe the manuscript is impressed, the AREG PKD consortium has, um, has further um, added to, um, to, the, to the promise of um, genetic biomarkers um, by demonstrating that in a cohort of about over 350 patients, that position in terms of where PKHD1 mutations occur uh, may be um, important in terms of the expressed phenotype. Specifically, mutations that disrupt the protein in the N-terminal third to one half um, of the protein are associated with a, um, a, a less aggressive kidney disease um, uh, progression. Whereas um, mutations that occur in the uh, and disrupt the, the uh, carboxy terminal third of, um, of the protein are associated with a poor liver outcome. And so again, I think um, the work from uh, this uh, 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 group is beginning to provide not just clinical insights, but perhaps genetic insights that may be um, able to be developed into uh, prognostic markers um, that will identify uh, subsets of ARPKD patients. So let's turn to imaging. In ADPKD, this is a very now famous uh, schema that was originally developed by Vince Torres at the Mayo Clinic um, and, and, um, uh, and then refined um, by Atsuka Pharmaceuticals. And what you can see is that there can be a, a dramatic cystic progression with massive kidney involvement before there is a functional decline um, in terms of EGFR. And, and this is true for a DPKD in adults. There are studies that are now beginning to examine this in children, but what about ARPKD? Well, unfortunately, it remains a black box. Um, as I mentioned, um, ARPKD um, uh, patients don't have an inexorable uh, increase in their total kidney volume or their total kidney length um, uh, as they go through childhood. Um, and, um, and in fact, the, the, the course in terms of their renal function and their renal structure um, doesn't fit a neat um, uh, equation. And so the, the standard forms of imaging um, that we have to follow uh, disease course um, and even the uh, using total kidney volume as a biomarker for disease progression just won't work um, in ARPKD. But there are new modalities that are being um, developed. Um, Catherine Dell and her um, colleagues at, um, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic um, have now uh, employed uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting um, as a quantitative um, uh, assessment of um, normal mice versus normal mice versus mice, a mouse model of ARPKD, 
and then in a very small initial study in normal healthy controls versus age matched uh, patients with ARPKD. And I think what you can appreciate from this slide is that there is a remarkable difference between the healthy control and ARPKD. And because this is a digital image, this can be um, it can lend itself to quantitative assessment. Um, in addition to this fingerprinting um, technology, Erin um, Hartung and her colleagues um, at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia have used a different um, MR technique, uh, diffuse tensor imaging, which characterizes tissue um, uh, microstructural abnormalities, um, and they have been able to quantitate the difference in renal parenchyma organization between ARPKD versus um, age match um, healthy controls. So two new MR based technologies that are digital and therefore lend themselves to quantitation that hold some promise for being developed um, as imaging biomarkers for ARPKD kidney disease progression. Of course, in ARPKD, we have to think about the liver lesion. Um, and again, um, uh, Dr. Hartung and her colleagues um, at CHOP have, um, have used um, uh, acoustic radiation force impulse looking at um, shear wave speed um, by ultrasound in ARPKD patients as compared to healthy controls, and they clearly can see a difference. To me, what's more um, uh, provocative and promising is that with left lobe imaging specifically, um, they were able to obtain high sensitivity and specificity in distinguishing ARPKD subjects who had cordial hypertension. So again, using this imaging technique to distinguish um, different cohorts of patients in terms of their liver disease progression. And then finally, let me turn um, to thinking about therapeutics. And, and of course, we have to think about both drug repurposing because there are now drugs in the pipeline for ADPKD as well as novel agents. And so the, um, the uh, arginine vasopressin V2 receptor um, access um, has been very well described um, as a therapeutic target for ADPKD. But in ARPKD, this access may also be in play, as shown um, by studies that have looked first pharmacologically in the PCK rat. And I'll remind you that the PCK rat has um, uh, mutations in the rat orthologue of PKHD1. And you can see that, um, that uh, rats that um, were not treated had the development of renal cystic disease, which was markedly attenu attenuated uh, by treatment with the tolvaptin um, uh, analog. In addition, a really lovely genetic study that was done at the Mayo Clinic um, bred the PCK rat to the Brattleboro rat. And I'll remind you that the Brattleboro rat um, has um, essentially null mutations in the gene encoding um, uh, arginine vasopressin. And so in mice that were, were diagenic for those two loci, so they're, they were the PCK rat, but they were missing the arginine, uh, a functional arginine vasopressin gene, had very um, uh, much attenuated renal cystic disease when you compare um, to, uh, to these kidneys where they were just the PCK kidneys. And fulfilling Cox postulate when these same group of rats were treated with DDA ADP, you not only had recrudescence of the renal cystic disease, but I think you could argue, particularly in females, that the disease was much more significant. So this access plays a role um, uh, in, at least in rodent models, um, in ARPKD pathogenesis. So when we think from a human perspective about epithelial um, abnormalities and potential targets for therapy, um, of course, we have to think about tolvaptin um, uh, as, as an agent that may have efficacy in this population of patients. I've mentioned the phase one clinical trial um, looking at receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, specifically tesavetinab. Metabolic abnormalities may also allow themselves through dietary manipulation and other forms of uh, modulation um, as being uh, modalities for attenuating uh, kidney disease course. So what is the state of play in 2020? Well, we know ARPKD involves cell proliferation, inflammation, fibrosis, and metabolic dysfunction. And this fusiform dilatation of the collecting duct be it medullary or a combination of medullary and, and uh, cortical collecting ducts, gives rise to these massively enlarged kidneys. What are the factors that may be um, uh, at, at play in leading um, to, uh, to this disease expression? Well, genetics, certainly the PKHD1 mutation, truncating versus non-truncating mutations, the recent work from AREG PKD in terms of mutation position, and work that's done at least in rodent models suggesting that PKD1 may be a, um, a genetic modifier for ARPKD patients. 
Is there a role for epigenetics? Is there a role for microRNAs? At this point, we don't really know. Is there a role for, uh, for the environment? For example, dietary salt. There was one initial study that suggested that low dietary salt exacerbated disease expression um, in, uh, in animal models of, uh, of ARPKD. So when we think about how can we capture the progression of disease, we have to think about biomarkers for disease severity. I've mentioned the beautiful studies from AREG PKD in terms of neonatal risk factors, and, and, and hopefully that will be able to be um, continue to be exploited as they mine their very rich data set for other clinical biomarkers. Biochemical markers, this um, is, a, is a much less well-developed story. The rate of, EG, of GFR decline um, is, is going to be difficult um, to, uh, to develop into a biomarker. But what's the role of copeptin, of other tubular markers, of inflammatory markers in the urine? The, the, the jury still is very much out on, uh, on these uh, possibilities. And then in terms of imaging, I've mentioned some very promising studies um, uh, in terms of magnetic resonance um, uh, fingerprinting um, and, uh, and, uh, and DTI that, that may hold promise for being uh, developed as uh, strategies for following kidney disease progression. My hope is that we may be able to do in a RPKD what um, uh, Cornet Legal and colleagues did for ADPKD. Um, and, and you'll recall that in work that, uh, that she did at the Mayo Clinic, they were able to, um, to take uh, data from a cohort of over 1,300 ADPKD patients. Um, and, um, and based on multivariate survival analysis, put together uh, a set of four variables that could be subsetted into a set of uh, risk categories. And I'd point out here, um, that uh, that sex was uh, was an important variable, at least in ADPKD, may not be in ARPKD, but there are clinical features in ADPKD. We certainly have evidence for clinical features in ARPKD. There are genetic features um, in ADPKD. Again, um, the work that I that I just summarized for ARPKD may be operative here. And in addition, we may be able to, um, to build into such a model um, imaging biomarkers as well as potentially um, uh, biochemical biomarkers. What's lovely about the pro-PKD um, score is it clearly subsets um, patients who are at low risk versus high risk. And I would point out uh, on the schema on the right-hand side that patients who are at low risk um, have a 50% chance of requiring renal replacement therapy at greater than 70 years of age, whereas those at high risk require renal replacement age, re renal replacement therapy before they reach 50 years of age. And so I think that this kind of approach is going to set the stage for us developing translational strategies for ARPKD and beginning to, at the very least, repurpose drugs that have been developed and are being um, uh, evaluated in ADPKD and other renal cystic diseases, as well as uh, bringing along uh, novel therapies that are hitting ARPKD-specific therapeutic targets the ultimate goal to attenuate um, the progression of the renal cystic disease um, such that children may live with chronic um, CKD but not require renal replacement therapy, uh, particularly in childhood. So let me summarize by saying ARPKD is a clinically significant disorder in children and increasingly adults as these children age out of pediatric care. Identification of disease-causing genes has expanded our understanding of cystic disease pathogenesis. Diagnostic strategies are improving, particularly with new genetics tools, such as um, next-generation sequencing-based multi-gene panels. In ARPKD, clinical trial design for targeted therapies has been hampered by the lack of prognostic and predictive markers. But as I hope I've convinced you today, research-ready cohorts and new strategies for biomarker development are changing the landscape. Thank you very much.